Hello, Journey. Welcome to our online campus, and we are so glad to have you with us today, whether you've been with us for a while, maybe your first time. So glad you joined us at uh, Journey Christian Church Online. Especially want to say happy Father's Day. Uh, if you're a father, hope you have a wonderful day. We celebrate you and we appreciate you, dads. Before I get into uh, this week's message, I want to say a quick word about last week's message. I shared a message on prejudice and racism that created a lot of conversations, and that's a good thing. It's quickly becoming the most shared sermon I've ever done here at Journey, and if you haven't already, I encourage you to watch or listen to it sometime this week. The responses I've seen and the conversations I've been a part of as a result of that message tells me we need to dig even deeper into this extremely important yet highly volatile topic. So in August, I'm going to be delivering a series of biblically-based, gospel-centered messages titled, Why Talk About Race? I'll be preparing for this series over the next few weeks, and I really look forward to sharing what God is teaching me, and more importantly, what role God wants Journey to have in being a voice for His message on restoring and reconciling all things in Jesus. Now let's jump into this week's fearless message. Several years ago, I read about a fascinating research experiment conducted by two Harvard business professors that illustrates the powerful effects of failure. The study went like this. Four monkeys were placed in a room that had a tall pole in the center. At the top of the pole was a bunch of bananas. Eventually, the bananas are discovered by one of the monkeys, and he starts to climb the pole to get to them. But just as he reaches out to grab one, he's doused with a torrent of cold water from a water hose. He squeals and scampers back down the pole and and abandons his attempt to retrieve a banana. Each of the four monkeys made a similar attempt, and each one was drenched with cold water. After making several attempts, they all finally gave up. The researchers then removed one of the monkeys and replaced it with a new monkey. The newcomer quickly discovers the bananas and begins to climb the pole, but the other three monkeys grab him and pull him to the ground. After trying to climb the pole several more times and being dragged down by the others each time, he eventually gives up and stops trying to get to the bananas. The researchers replaced the original four monkeys one by one, and each time a new monkey was brought in, he would be dragged down by the others before he could reach the bananas. In time, the room was filled with monkeys who who had never received a cold shower trying to retrieve a banana, but yet none of them would climb the pole and none of them knew why. Unfortunately, people who've gotten used to failure can be a lot like those monkeys. They make the same mistakes over and over again and aren't quite sure why. They always do what they've always done and they always get what they've always gotten. If you fear that failure is making a monkey out of you, Let me show you a formula for failure that can at least start to help you understand your self-defeating behavior. First of all, it all starts with a mess up. We all make mistakes, but people who seem to be stuck in a cyclical pattern of failure refuse to take responsibility for their mistakes. They're like the drivers who wrote the following explanations for the auto accidents in which they were involved. Maybe you've heard of some of these. An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my car, and vanished. The indirect cause of this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. I was coming home, pulled into the wrong driveway, and hit a tree I do not have. The guy was all over the road, and I had to swerve a number of times before hitting him. I pulled off the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law in in the passenger seat, and headed over the embankment. (laughs) People who are stuck on the freeway of failure often see every mistake or error as somebody else's fault. So first, there's a mess up, which usually leads to a blow up. People make a minor mistake and angrily overreact by taking out their frustration on themselves or others around them. Unchecked anger makes a small problem bigger. One guy wrote, a bad temper is its own scourge. Few things are more bitter than to feel bitter. A man's venom poisons himself more than his victim. A mess up leads to a blow up, which turns into a cover-up. It's just the nature of people to try to cover up their mistakes. 
The tactic is as old as Adam and Eve hiding and covering themselves in the garden. People will go to great lengths to see that their failures stay secret. They live by the motto, if at first you don't succeed, destroy any evidence that you ever tried. The mess up leads to a blow up, which turns into a cover up, which strangely causes people to speed up. People foolishly try to leave their troubles behind by working harder and faster, but without changing their direction. And as we've repeated many times in the past, direction, not intention, determines destination. One man said, our world is a world where people don't know what they want and they're willing to go through hell to get it. It's true that the more lost people become, the faster they seem to go, but eventually you run out of fuel and finally you have to give up and that's the last piece of the formula. It starts with a mess up, which leads to a blow up, that turns into a cover up, which causes people to speed up until they finally give up. Friends, that is a formula for understanding failure. Now, let me ask you a question. The last time you failed, did you stop trying because you failed or did you fail because you stopped trying? Failure can be very painful, sometimes physically, but more often emotionally. And for many, the pain of failure leads to the fear of failure and the fear of failure stops all forward progress. We're afraid to dream. We're afraid to try, we're scared to risk, we are paralyzed by our past failures. The real issue I wanna talk about in this message is how you and I can fail forward. That's the title of one of John Maxwell's best-selling books, and in it he writes this, the difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. Let me read it one more time. The difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. So how can we fail forward? Number one, remember everybody fails. Everybody fails. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody misses the mark of perfection. James in the New Testament says, we all stumble in many ways. That's just a healing statement to make. If you're watching this with somebody, turn to them right now and say, we all stumble in many ways. Now turn to them and say, but you stumble more than I do, okay? People sometimes say, but what if I fail? I wanna laugh and say, what do you mean if? The facts of life are you have already failed many, many times in your life. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that you're failing right now in some area of your life, and you know it. The writer of Ecclesiastes put it like this, there is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. One of the things we frequently say around journey is nobody's perfect. We even have that printed on our t-shirts. Even the most talented and gifted among us fail. The average NBA player only makes about 50% of their shots. That means they miss every other time. The man who has the highest batting average ever in Major League Baseball history, Ted Williams, He batted 400 for one season out of the 19 that he played. That means that six times out of 10, he walked back to the dugout having failed to get on base. And he's considered the greatest hitter of all time. Michael Jordan made 22 game-winning shots over the course of his legendary career. You know know how many he missed? 26. Michael Jordan missed more game winners than he made. And he's considered the greatest of all time. Superstars strike out. All stars miss, everybody fails. Did you know successful entrepreneurs almost never have success with their first business or even their second or third? According to a Tulane University study, the average for entrepreneurs is 3.8 failures before they finally form a profitable business. There's an old saying in business that the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. The failures of many successful people have been well documented. For example, Sir James Dyson had 5,126 failed prototypes over the course of 15 years before creating the best-selling bagless vacuum cleaner that bears his name and giving him a net worth of four and a half billion dollars. Theodore Seuss Geisel, known to generations as Dr. Seuss, the much-loved children's author, had his first book rejected by 27 different publishers. His books that weren't good enough for these publishers went on to sell more than 600 million copies worldwide. A Van Gogh painting will cost you upwards of a hundred million dollars nowadays, but in his lifetime, Vincent Van Gogh 
sold just one painting, the Red Vineyard, and the sale came not long before his death. Abraham Lincoln's failures are broad and numerous, yet today he's considered the greatest president in U.S. history. Jerry Seinfeld was booed off the stage at his first attempt at stand-up comedy. Before she created the wizarding world of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling was a broke, depressed, divorced, single mother writing a novel while studying. Friends, everybody fails. We all stumble in many ways. Here's a second step to failing forward. Realize failure is not fatal. Failure is not fatal. We vastly exaggerate the effects of failure. We blow it way out of proportion in our thinking. But friends, failure is not the end of the world. On the contrary, it often becomes the beginning of something better. The fear of failure is more damaging than the failure itself. One of my favorite Proverbs is found in Proverbs 24, 16. The Proverbs writer says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. I love that verse because it tells us even the righteous fall, even the people who are trying to do what's right make mistakes. They mess up, they blow up, they cover up, they speed up, but they don't give up. Successful people are not people who never fail. They're people who get back up again and keep going. Failure does not have the final word in their lives. It is not fatal. Paul in the New Testament is a great example of this. He once wrote this honest appraisal of his work to the church in Corinth. He said, we're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Paul is saying, I've taken my share of lumps in life. My life has been no picnic, but I keep going. There's an old saying in Texas that goes, it doesn't matter how much milk you spill as long as you don't lose your cow. The problem comes when you see only the spilled milk and then you have a cow. One of the most helpful tactics in dealing with a fear of failure is to redefine failure. What do I mean? Failure is not failing to reach your goal. Failure is not setting a goal. Failure is not failing to fulfill your dreams. Failure is not having a dream. Failure is not falling down. Failure is refusing to get back up again. Failure is refusing to try at all. Paul says, I've been knocked down a lot. Everybody gets knocked down. It's what you do after you get back up that counts. SpaceX, the California space technology company, pioneered the science of safely returning used rocket boosters to Earth. But a few years back, they also uploaded a YouTube video showing some of the most dramatic times that it did not succeed. The two-minute video titled How Not to Land an Orbital Rocket Booster is set to the song The Liberty Bell by John Philip Sousa and includes humorous captions for each clip of impressive rocket explosions. In one segment that shows SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk observing a smoldering rocket, the caption reads, it's just a scratch. Another chimes in, well, technically it did land, just not in one piece. The video even pokes fun at the phrase rapid, unscheduled disassembly, a phrase Musk has made famous to describe untimely and expensive explosions of impressive size. The video ends, however, with a triumphant footage of its first two successful landings, one on land and one on sea. The company's success rate continued to rise over recent years, and it finally culminated two weeks ago, June the 3rd, when the first manned spacecraft in nine years from U.S. soil was successfully launched from nearby Cape Canaveral by SpaceX. While not always easy to recognize in the moment, the failures we experience in life are so often essential in preparing us for the future. Whether our failures are the consequences of our own sin or inevitable circumstances, we can always look back and remember God's faithfulness in the past and trust that it will extend into the future. Here's a third step to failing forward. Recognize the benefits of failure. We usually think of failure as a negative experience, but successful people know how to leverage their past failures into greater learnings that help them better prepare for their future. In other words, they learn positive lessons from their negative experiences. Here's another important piece of the failure formula. The more you do, the more you fail. The more you fail, the more you learn. The more you learn, the better you get. Now, the operative word here is learn. If you keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over and over again, that's probably not a mistake. That's most likely an addiction 
or a compulsive, obsessive behavior. And that's a whole different talk. But the ability to turn adversity into an advantage is one of the most valuable assets a person can have. John Maxwell, in his book, Failing Forward, points out at least six benefits of failure. Let's take a look at them. First of all, failure creates resilience. Nothing in life breeds resiliency like adversity and failure. An old article in Time Magazine reported on a group of people that they studied who showed remarkable resilience. You know who they were? People who had lost their jobs three different times because of company closings or downsizing. Researchers expected this group to be discouraged, but found them to be surprisingly optimistic. Their adversity actually created an emotional advantage for them because they'd already lost a job and found another one at least twice. They were better able to handle that setback better than people who'd worked for only one company, but suddenly found themselves unemployed. Failure creates resiliency. Secondly, failure develops maturity. Failure can make you better if you don't let it make you bitter. Why? Because it promotes wisdom and maturity. Every time you make mistakes and still attempt to move forward in spite of them is a test of character. There will always come a time when giving up is easier than getting up. When giving in looks more attractive than digging in. And in those moments, character may be the only thing you have to draw on to keep you going. Paul wrote, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Failure provides greater opportunities. In 1978, Bernie Marcus, the son of a Russian cabinet maker in Newark, New Jersey, was fired from Handy Dan, a regional do-it-yourself hardware retailer. That firing prompted Marcus to team up with former co-worker Arthur Blank to start their own business. So in 1979, they opened their first store in Atlanta, Georgia, called the Home Depot. Perhaps you've heard of that. Today, they have over 2,200 stores employing more than 440,000 orange-blooded associates with annual sales in their last fiscal year of 100 and 10 billion. I'm sure Bernie Marcus wasn't happy about getting fired, but if he had stayed at Handy Dan, there probably wouldn't be a Home Depot. And the only people that would be happy about that are the people who work at Lowe's. Failure prompts innovation. Early in the 20th century, a boy whose family had immigrated from Sweden to Illinois sent 25 cents to a publisher for a book on photography. What he received instead was a book on ventriloquism. What did he do? He adapted and learned the skills of being a ventriloquist. The boy was named Edgar Bergen, and for more than 40 years, he entertained audiences around the world with the help of a wooden dummy named Charlie McCarthy. So when things don't work out like you plan, get a new plan. Remember, God has a plan for your future, but it's most likely not your plan for your future. Failure can bring unexpected breakthroughs. Do you know how many things were invented as a result of a mistake somebody made? Bubble wrap that we used to pack thing for packaging was originally created to be a trendy new wallpaper. Implantable pacemakers were invented when Wilson Great Batch pulled out the wrong sized resistor and plugged it into a circuit of a heart rhythm recording device he was working on. Kellogg's cornflakes resulted when boiled wheat was left in a baking pan overnight. Scott paper towels were, were launched when a toilet paper machine put too many layers of tissue together. James Joyce wrote, a man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. Finally, failure motivates. I love an old football story from the days of Bear Bryant coaching Alabama. With his team ahead by six points with less than two minutes remaining in the game and his team possessing the ball, Bryant sent his quarterback uh, into the game with instructions to play it safe, call one running play, and then take a knee and run the clock out. When the quarterback got into the huddle, though, he said, Coach said, let's play it safe, but that's what they're expecting. Let's give him a surprise. And he called a pass play. When he dropped back to throw, a defensive back 
who's also a champion sprinter, intercepted his pass, took off down the sideline toward the end zone. The quarterback, who was not known to be a good runner, took off after the cornerback and surprisingly ran him down from behind, tackled him before he could score. Alabama ended up hanging on to win the game. After the clock expired, the opposing coach approached Bear Bryant and said, Coach, I can't believe your quarterback caught my world-class sprinter. Bear Bryant said, you don't understand. Your man was running for six points. My man was running for his life. Failure motivates you like nothing else. When you step back from the negative circumstances facing you, you will discover there are many positive benefits. God uses failure to educate me, to motivate me, and to cultivate me into the person he wants me to be. It's all a part of his plan. That's why the Proverbs writer says sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. I've always loved this writing titled, When It Looks Like I've Failed. Let me share it with you. When it looks like I've failed, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? For failure doesn't mean I'm a failure. It does mean I haven't yet succeeded. Failure doesn't mean I've accomplished nothing. It does mean I've learned something. Failure doesn't mean I've been a fool. It does mean I had enough faith to experiment. Failure doesn't mean I've been disgraced. It does mean I dared to try. Failure doesn't mean I don't have it. It does mean I have to do something in a different way. Failure doesn't mean I'm inferior. It does mean I'm not perfect. Failure doesn't mean I've wasted my life. It does mean I have an excuse to start over again. Failure doesn't mean I should give up. It does mean I must try harder. Failure doesn't mean I'll never make it. It does mean I need more patience. And failure doesn't mean you've abandoned me. It does mean you have a better idea. The fourth step to failing forward is to relax in God's grace. The psalmist said this, God knows what we're made of. He remembers that we are dust. Friends, God isn't surprised when I fail. He knows I'm only human. He knows my weaknesses, and he isn't surprised by them. And when we fail, that doesn't mean that God's going to stop loving us. If you think you have to be perfect in order for God to love you, you've missed the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is that God loves you, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. Not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus has already done. You can't do anything to make God love you more, and you can't do anything to make God love you less. He loves you just as much on your bad days as he does on your good days. God's love for you is not based upon your performance. That's why it's called grace, and it really is amazing. Maybe you grew up in a performance-based home where it was deeply ingrained in you, if I fail, I'm worthless. If I succeed, I'm valuable. Success meant self-esteem. Failure meant rejection. Thank God, God does not treat us that way. Paul said it like this, God canceled our debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow. He took away that record with its rules and nailed it to a cross. Friends, the Christian life is not a mistake-free life, but it can be a guilt-free life. Paul concludes the greatest paragraph ever penned about love by saying this, Love never fails. If you're watching at home, wherever you are, read it with me. Love never fails. That means if we fill our life with love for God and love for people, you will never be a failure, regardless of what happens to you, because God is at work in you. I want to suggest to you, whether you've got five weeks or five months or five years or 50 years left in this present world, you can make the rest of your life the best of your life if you live a life of love, a life of love for God and love for people. If you do that, it really doesn't matter what you achieve because you can never be considered a failure if you're doing it in love because love never fails. I wanna say there's really only one failure you and I seriously need to fear. And the Hebrews writer tells us what that is. See that no one fails to receive God's grace. During the building of the iconic Golden Gate Bridge over San Francisco Bay, construction fell badly behind schedule because several workers had accidentally fallen from the scaffolding to their deaths. 
Engineers and administrators could find no solution to the costly delays. Finally, someone suggested a gigantic net be hung under the bridge to catch any who fail. Despite the enormous cost, the engineers opted to try the net. After it was installed, the work resumed and was hardly interrupted again. A worker or two fell into the net, but all were saved. No more lives were lost. Ultimately, the time lost to fear was regained by replacing fear with faith in the net. Did you know God has put a wonderful net under us called grace? And when we fail, not if, but when we fail, we are not defeated and we are not destroyed. The only failure we have to fear is the failure to receive God's grace. And you can eliminate that failure right now by surrendering your life, by trusting faith in Jesus Christ, who took all of our failures and nailed them to his cross. I want to encourage you, if you've never done that, would you do that right now? I'm going to ask you if you will. Would you just pray with me? Just pray along with me right now. So, Father, we come to you and we acknowledge that we've all stumbled and that I've stumbled in many ways. Lord, none of us is perfect, and we own that before you. And so we ask right now, would you help us and lead us and come into our lives, we pray, so that we might walk with confidence, without fear, in your grace. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So Jesus, I wanna receive that right now. I take this time to surrender my life to you In Jesus' name, amen. If that's the first time you've ever prayed a prayer like that, or the first time you really understood what that meant, here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to click on the link that says journeychristian.com, next step. And I want you to let us know, I trusted Jesus today. I'm taking the step to trust in Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Maybe for you, uh, what we need to help you do after that would be to say, I want to be baptized. Or maybe you've already made a commitment to Jesus at some time in the past, but you've never been baptized into Christ. I want to say to you, check that link. Let us know that. One of our pastors will follow up with you. I pray you will relax in God's grace and you'll fear less your failures and you'll trust more in God's grace. Well, church, as we continue in this time of worship today, We're going to be singing a song that says these words. It says, people come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. And even though we're in a season where we can't gather together physically, I just want to encourage you and remind you that those words still remain very true. As we join together in this sound of worship, we are united by the Spirit of God. So let's just sing this out. Let's lift up the name of Jesus from wherever we're at today. Jesus 
Jesus, the Lord of heaven, friend forever, His kingdom comes. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is badly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where help comes from. Praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Oh, we sing, swing wide. Come on. Swing wide, all you have. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All these children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Come. 